Welcome to the third installment of the Clean My Space Power Hour, where I hang out with you while you clean. In this episode, we are gonna cover everything from floors to baseboards, dusting, and so much more. We also have a couple of DIY recipes that I'm gonna share with you. So get your cleaning products and tools, get your to-do list out, and let's start cleaning. Part of the reason I hate cleaning is because sometimes it just feels like the never ending story. That's why if you wanna get something done, set a goal, whether it's a surface, a room, or an amount of time that you're going to spend dedicating to cleaning, just set yourself a goal. Meet that goal and it actually helps you feel better and more empowered about the work that you're doing. I know for me, if I just said I have to clean my room, that means it could be for a day. I could be so frustrated, I'll get distracted, I'll waste my time, I won't know how to get the job done. Whereas if I set a goal, I'm gonna clean my room and I'm giving myself one hour to do it, well now we are talking business and that makes the job much easier for me to get done. The best way to maximize the time you spend cleaning is to spend time cleaning the things that are most important to you. I don't think there's value in cleaning something that doesn't necessarily bother you, but just something that you kind of think you're supposed to clean because your mother-in-law cleans it or someone you watched on TikTok cleans it. No, no. You need to think about your MIAs or your most important areas. And the best way I can describe this is feel your body's physical reaction when you're present in that space. So if I'm in this kitchen and I see it and it is a messy disaster, my heart rate increases. I start to get anxious, like I feel it. So I know if my kitchen is messy, it's an MIA. It's one of my most important areas. But my dining room, I mean the room we use the least on this floor of the house, I couldn't give two hoots about that. And if it is not clean on a random Tuesday, it is not going to affect my day or my heart rate. So when I get to it, I get to it, but I'm not gonna focus on it on a daily basis. And that's what I want you to do. Really think about those areas that are important and that's where you're gonna focus your efforts. You can, I'm not saying you never have to clean those other areas, but you can let go of the feeling that you need to clean those areas all the time. Something that leads to the disdain of cleaning is the overwhelm of deciding the cleaning products to choose. And that's why I recommend just slimming it down and going back to basics. You can do so much cleaning with just soap and water. And if you add a few pantry staples in like vinegar, baking soda, and hydrogen peroxide, well, that's a first aid kit staple, but you get what I'm saying. You can even accomplish more cleaning. In fact, we have a DIY recipe book that you can click on, it's down below. It's DIY cleaning recipes that we've created and we've tweaked over the years. You don't have to spend a lot of money on these. You can make them for pennies and they get the job done. I know so many folks stand in that cleaning aisle kind of bewildered trying to decide what to get and that just makes the cleaning process frustrating. So take it back to basics, make your own cleaning products, only buy what you absolutely need and that will help to reduce your frustration. We exist in a very distracting world and for someone who has to do something that they don't love doing, it's very easy to choose the distraction and procrastinate on the work we have set out to do. Which is why when I clean, I have a pretty steadfast rule. I put in my AirPods, I turn on a podcast, and I put my phone where I can't see it. Because that way I just focus on the task and I'm not distracted by my phone or my watch. And sometimes what I'll do is actually turn my phone or watch on do not disturb so that I'm not distracted by texts or calls or anything of that nature because that will then take me away from the work I'm doing and the work I wanna spend the least amount of time doing. The more I'm distracted, the more I have to prolong the pain of cleaning. If you don't like cleaning, figure out ways to stack your cleaning tasks on top of one another so you don't have to spend a whole bunch of time doing things that could have been condensed into one cleaning session. For example, I often talk about the importance of pre-treating a surface. 
That means finding a dirty surface, spraying it with a product, whether it's a cleaner or a disinfectant, and letting that product sit for the correct amount of time for that product to do the heavy lifting for you. That way, you don't have to spend time scrubbing and the product will do what it was intended to do, which is lift that dirt or kill that bacteria. Now, while that's happening, you can accomplish so many other things. In fact, when I'm cleaning, I will pre-treat my surfaces, unload the dishwasher, put things away, so by the time I get back to that surface that's been pre-treated, I have to do less work. I just have to wipe the surface down instead of having to scrub or work a little bit harder. Think about it when it comes to laundry. You can throw a load of laundry in, run through your dishwasher, get a few tasks done, and stack them instead of spreading them out over a period of time. I'm likely one of the few people on the internet who talk about cleaning that will say this, don't overclean. I think so many people online love creating all of this cleaning content and they are cleaning things that don't need to be clean or they're spending way too much time cleaning something. In my opinion, that's just a waste of time. I think cleaning is something that has to be done and should be paid no more attention to. And with that being said, I also know that there is a spectrum of cleaning emotions. Some of us care deeply about cleaning. Some of us barely care about cleaning, hate doing it, don't wanna think about it and wanna do the bare minimum. Be honest with yourself, know where you fall. And if you're kinda of like me and you're over here, don't feel that you're obligated to spend the same amount of time that the people over here spend. You live your life. You have your people, your job, your circumstances, your community. It is really hard to live a life where you are comparing yourself to other people, whether it's a neighbor, a friend, a family member, or for heaven's sake, an influencer. Remember, influencers' jobs are to make it look like they are cleaning all the time and they live in a perfect home. I mean, not me, I don't ever try to espouse that, but so many people in this space, that is what they try to do. And what does it do for the average viewer? It makes them feel bad about themselves. So no, let that go. Let go of what other people are doing and just focus on you and what you can do today. I'll give you a perfect example. Sometimes I'll get messages from people who have just had babies and they're like, I can't keep up, Melissa. What did you do when you had a baby? How did you keep your house clean? What I did, I hired help and I lowered my expectations. And I told myself my house isn't always gonna be this messy and hectic, but I have to give myself a break right now. I have to lower my expectations and I have to spend money on help because that is what is giving me sanity. And I didn't feel bad about it. It was like a totally guilt-free move. So please let go of those expectations, let go of what other people are doing and just focus on you and what you need to feel good and clean in your home. Next up, a DIY floor cleaning recipe that's designed to leave your floors looking gorgeous and your home smelling fresh. But before we do that, I wanna let you know that over at makersclean.com, by the way, I've got a link for you down below or you can just visit the website. We've got some incredible Black Friday week pre-sales happening. We're gonna have even more as Black Friday and Cyber Monday hit. So if you're looking to pick up some Makers Clean products, this is your time. In the next video, you're going to see me using the awesome Makers Mop, that taco-shaped mop. That is available on the makersclean.com website as well. So go check that out. But before you do, let's clean those floors. One of the largest surfaces in your home would be your floors. That's why when you make your own floor cleaner, you can really impact the way your home smells. And you can also save a lot of money by making your own. A good general floor cleaner recipe consists of the following one and one half cups of water. If you're using a bucket, make it warm. A quarter cup of white vinegar, an eighth of a cup of rubbing alcohol, two drops of dish soap, which is about an eighth of a teaspoon, five to 10 drops of your favorite essential oils. In terms of my favorite scent combination for the floor, quite frankly, just about nothing makes me happier than being at a spa, which is why I love using a combination of lavender essential oils and eucalyptus essential oils. I will just mix the two and, oh my gosh, my house smells spa-like. Now, you can either make this up in a bucket and use it with a string or microfiber twist mop, or you can use it in a spray bottle and use it with a flathead microfiber mop, which is what I'm doing here.
Now that you have that DIY floor cleaning recipe, let's talk about some specific floor types that you might have around the house, like laminate, hardwood, vinyl, and tile, because they all do need to be treated a little bit differently. Floors used to be so easy to take care of. Get a mop and a bucket and go to town. But now we have so many different types of flooring and we have to be quite particular in terms of how we take care of our floors so that they last for a long time and they look great. Because let's be honest, when you damage a floor, it is an expensive and an annoying repair. So in this video, we are gonna cover how to clean three key hard floor surfaces, hardwood, laminate, and luxury vinyl flooring. Next up, some general do's and don'ts for all of these floors. And these are gonna come out of my mouth in no particular order. So I'm sorry if it's not a cohesive list of all the do's and all the don'ts. First, you always want to sweep or vacuum before you mop, and you don't wanna use the beater bar on your vacuum when you're cleaning a hard floor surface. Beater bars are that roller brush on your vacuum that is designed to kind of pull things out of your carpet and get them super clean. It can scratch or damage hard floor surfaces, so always use that soft bristle brush on your vacuum when you're cleaning your hard floors or sweep them. Only when that's done can you mop. If you don't do that, you're gonna scratch your floors. You do wanna make sure that you're using protection on the bottom of your furniture, felt pads, because if you don't do that, your floors can scratch and these floors are particularly difficult to repair. The whole gamut, you might have to remove the plank, you might have to refinish it, and it's always gonna be an eyesore. Do mop in the direction of the grain. If you mop in the opposite direction of the way that the grain runs or the floor is laid, you're gonna see streaks. Don't use a steam mop. Steam is just no bueno for this type of flooring. I know all the steam mop companies are gonna tell you that theirs are safe, but if you talk to the flooring installers and the flooring manufacturers, they're gonna tell you they're not safe. So in this case, I'm gonna side with the manufacturers and not the people who are trying to sell you the cleaning tools. You do wanna make sure you're using the appropriate type of mop when you're cleaning this floor. If you use a string mop or a yacht mop, you're gonna to leave too much moisture behind and that is not good for this type of flooring. So you wanna use a flathead mop and as minimal moisture as possible to clean the floors. In fact, you can even follow up with a final mop with just a dry pad to remove any excess moisture. Do make sure that when there are any spills or stains, they are cleaned up immediately. That goes for anything from water up to paint, nail polish, cat puke, or juice. It all has to go. Despite how durable your flooring might be, even your luxury vinyl tile which or flooring, which you know is waterproof, you can still deal with stains. So anytime there's a stain or moisture or liquid on a surface, just blot it up and clean it as soon as you can. Don't use any old product to mop your floor. In fact, hardwood and engineered hardwood, laminate and luxury vinyl tile all have different requirements in terms of how they need to be cleaned. So make sure that you know the type of flooring you have, you do your research and you use the appropriate product so that your floors can last a good long time and look beautiful. We're in the process of finishing our basement right now. In fact, if you hear a bunch of clamoring, that's because construction is happening as we're recording this. We decided to install luxury vinyl floors in the basement that essentially match this color that we have here because we loved the color and we wanted the durability and clearly you can't put hardwood in a basement. The reason is, is because that flooring has to be waterproof and luxury vinyl is waterproof. We have a pool in the backyard, plus we do a lot of outdoor activities and people come in. So we wanted to make sure that there wouldn't be any issues with moisture penetrating the floors. Now, that said, we're still gonna be quite mindful. We're gonna have a scatter rug there to collect any debris that you know comes in from the outside. So we'll maintain the floor that way. But in terms of mopping the floor, the things that you wanna keep in mind, you don't wanna use any detergent that has a high 
pH to it. So that would be, you know, anything that's corrosive plus bleach or ammonia based products you would not want to use on the floor. The other thing I will say to stay away from is anything that leaves kind of a hazy glaze on a floor. So uh, a wood oil soap, not appropriate for luxury vinyl tile, even something that is supposed to leave a shine. Those are great for tile. Those are not great for this type of flooring. So we have a very basic recipe that works really well. And in fact, most of the time I find it doesn't even need a rinse. I have a little rhyme and I'm gonna share it with you and it applies to all the floors. And that is less is more when mopping the floor. Say it with me. Less is more when mopping the floor. Less is more when mopping the floor. Less is more when mopping the floor. And the reason that's important is because the more soapy stuff you use, the stickier things are gonna feel underfoot. So you actually want your floor cleaner to be very well diluted so that you don't feel that stickiness and it rinses and dries clean. To mix this up, you're going to use two cups of warm water, a quarter cup of white vinegar, an eighth of a cup of rubbing alcohol, an eighth of a teaspoon of dish soap. It's just a few little drops and five to 10 drops of your favorite essential oil if you feel up for it. I'm recommending to use this recipe in a spray bottle and spraying it on the floor right before you mop it up. But if you are more of a bucket kind of guy or gal, you can up this recipe and put it in a bucket and work that way. The first thing to know about hardwood floor is you can have finished hardwood and unfinished hardwood. Now, the quickest way to find out if your floors are unfinished is to take a drop of water and just put it on the floor. If it beads, you know that your floor is finished. If the water soaks in, the floors are unfinished. And what that tells you is that you can't use moisture on your unfinished floors. So in the event that that is you, you are just sweeping your floors, you are not using moisture or liquid to clean them. And if something spills, you gotta blot it up immediately. So with that being said, we have a very straightforward DIY recipe that you can use. Now in this recipe, it's essentially the same as the luxury vinyl tile cleaner, but we've backed out the rubbing alcohol. And the reason that is, is because the particular type of varnish that hardwood or engineered hardwood has doesn't love uh, rubbing alcohol. Whereas rubbing alcohol is great on the other two types of finishes because it helps water dry quickly. If hardwood and luxury vinyl and laminate were all out for dinner, laminate would be the one that made all kinds of modifications to its order. It's finicky. All right, and here's what laminate is. It's just a pile of different layers all stuck together with a photo of something on top. And it behaves like hardwood in that it doesn't like moisture, but then the top layer gets really streaky if you clean it with the wrong thing. And if you use the wrong product, it can expand and contract and do that weird behavior that wood does. So you gotta be really picky with the way that you clean your laminate. That said, it's pretty durable, so that's why people love it, and it's also way less expensive than hardwood. Okay, so the way that you wanna clean it is like this. You wanna avoid any type of soapy detergent whatsoever. So in the DIY recipe that we have put together, you'll see there's vinegar, you'll see there's rubbing alcohol, you'll see there's water, but there is no soap. So here it is. For our DIY recipe, use two cups of warm water, a half a cup of white vinegar, a half a cup of rubbing alcohol, and of course, five to 10 drops of your favorite essential oils if you're feeling adventurous. If you're looking for a great mop to clean your floors with, why don't you check out the Maker's Mop? Yeah, I'm biased. It's a taco-shaped mop, but it just won the Good Housekeeping 2021 Cleaning Awards, so you can check out makersclean.com to learn more. If you walk into your kitchen or your bathroom and you're noticing a funky smell that you can't quite get rid of, it might be a sink issue. So in this video, I am gonna show you how to deal with that. There are three or 3.5 main reasons why you're going to have a smelly sink. The first one has to do with what goes into the sink. Grease, food, 
old stuff, soap scum, all of it lands in the sink. And if your sink isn't cleaned regularly and rinsed thoroughly, that's going to build up. Now, the next part to that is the bacteria that then develops by feeding off of all of those remnants. That bacteria can start to be smelly. I'll also group into this section sponges and other things that kind of sit in the sink. The second key cause is either a partial or a full clog. Now the visual indicator for this is that your sink is going to drain slower. In the bathroom, it's typically a buildup of hair and toothpaste and other things that have landed in the sink and just haven't been able to drain properly. And in the kitchen, it's often food related. Either way, water sits in the middle of your sink trap, your J trap or your P trap and it just stagnates. That gets smelly, and of course there's a buildup, water's not flowing properly, you're going to notice a smell. Now the third key cause, and this one's pretty serious, is a blocked sewer vent. If a sewer vent is news to you, I'll briefly explain what it is. It's a series of pipes that are built into your home to help essentially ventilate the sewage systems in your home. So it vents out toilet air and sink air. If there's a blockage, that gets pushed back down and right into your home. It does not smell pleasant. So the rudimentary stuff you can do to keep your sink smelling fresh on a daily basis comes down to keeping the things in your sink clean and dry. So your sponge, when you're done using your sponge, rinse it with soapy water, wring it out well, and set it on top of your counter to dry. Don't throw it back in the sink. Same thing goes for any sponge cloths or dish rags that you use. Even these little sink traps can get full of stuff. And it's really important not only to empty them out every day, but I even put mine in the dishwasher once a week because I know how grimy and disgusting they can get. Now think about the job that your sink does. You're pouring all kinds of things down there, things that you should and things that you shouldn't. But your sink kind of develops this film, this layer, and you know, oil gets in there, coffee gets in there, spaghetti sauce. And if you're not cleaning your sink regular, regularly, you get this film that sort of builds up. And not only does it make your sink look kind of dull and dirty, but bacteria can also start to feed off of that film. That leads to odors. And that is also one of the reasons why people say kitchen sinks are among the dirtiest places in your home, because that is where the weird stuff starts to grow. Now, it's so important to clean your sink on a regular basis. And to do this, I use either a dish brush or a sponge. I throw some dish soap in there, a little bit of baking soda, and I give it a good scrub. I rinse it, I dry it, it looks great. And if I'm not seeing any visual oil or I don't feel any kind of slickness in the sink, I know it's not going to be smelly. There's so much more to the drain that meets the eye. And in fact, when it is said that the kitchen sink is the dirtiest place in the home, truly it's the P trap or the J trap that is the most dirty place in the home because that is where all of the gross stuff lives. So we can clean this in two ways. We can use a chemical to do the cleaning or we can use a physical action to do the cleaning. So we're gonna start with some chemical options, the first of which can kind of be like easy DIY stuff. If I'm noticing a real odor, what I might do is I might put a cup of baking soda down each drain because of course I have a double, uh, a double sink in my kitchen. I will let that sit for 30 minutes. The baking soda does its thing. It kind of helps to tamp down and deodorize anything that's in there is kind of building up. I will then boil the vinegar and dump that down after 30 minutes. Now I have talked recently about how vinegar and baking soda are not a good cleaner. But in this case, if you've ever seen a daycare room before, you know that vinegar and baking soda create this wonderful volcanic reaction. They do it at my daughter's daycare all the time. The kids love it, but it's great at creating something that can physically break down and push stuff through your drain. So that's a great DIY option. Now there's some products that I really like. Specifically, I've had great experiences with Green Gobbler. This is not sponsored. I've just used it enough times and I've had some weird stuff in my sink and it has worked like a charm. You read the package, you dump the product down the sink, add some hot water, Bob or Tom or whoever is your uncle, problem solved. 
If you've watched Clean My Space videos before, you know that I live and die by the three wave system, which is what I created to help clean any room without feeling overwhelmed. So in this video, I'm going to show you how I've applied that to the kitchen. If you want to learn more about the three wave system, I've got a link down below to the ebook that I've put together teaching you exactly how to use it, but get a taste for it in this video here. Hair up gloves on. We are doing the three wave system. My starting point is that laundry room door just behind me. And in the first wave, I'm going to be tidying and getting rid of all of the clutter. Now my goal here is to move everything over to the sink area and then I'm going to tackle the dishes. For demonstrative purposes only, we left meat sauce and tomato sauce because you know we never do this otherwise in the pan overnight. It is dry and it is caked on. Uh, so what I would do before actually pre-treating this with product is I'm just going to try and scrape out as many chunks as I can because then that means that the product can actually focus on, you know, getting rid of the buildup instead of getting rid of the food chunks. Now the purpose of this is to tidy and organize the kitchen so that I can actually get down to the heavy duty work. And in a kitchen cleaning specifically during wave one, you also have to tackle all of your dishes, which is what I'm doing here, because you need no dishes for you to actually be able to clean. And you also need to pre-treat because we deal with a lot of greasy, grimy items in the kitchen. So if you notice splatters on your backsplash, something sticky on your counter, or even a pot or a pan that really needs a good scrubbing, pre-treat it now. Now I'm moving my way around the kitchen, moving from left to right, top to bottom. So I'm taking everything with me, moving it toward the sink. That red bag that I have is also going to be used for gathering up any items that I want to take to recycling. That way I don't have to keep running back and forth. So you'll see I kind of drag it with me as I go. I like wearing gloves when I'm doing this because A, they have great grip and I happen to have butter fingers and B, it allows me to pick up things that I otherwise might think are a little bit gross from time to time, especially if you leave your kitchen unclean for a few days. Now, if you don't have a dishwasher, this would be your time to hand wash your pots or pans. You want to have no dishes before you move on. You'll notice, and this is controversial, that I'm not really rinsing anything before I put it in the dishwasher. I scraped a lot of my stuff, but I'm actually challenging my dishwasher to clean as much as it can without me running water. And that's A, because I'm using a good quality dishwashing detergent, and B, because I'm trying to save water, and it's actually more efficient to not pre-rinse, put everything in the dishwasher, use a great detergent, um, than it is to pre-rinse and then put stuff in the dishwasher. It just wastes a lot of water. So uh, I know some people don't love it because their dishwasher can get dirty and stinky and the trade-off is that you do have to clean your filter more often, but I think it's worth it. Back to it. I have a video teaching you how to load your dishwasher and also how to maintain your dishwasher. So I will link both of those for you down below. What I love seeing is how clean my kitchen already looks and I haven't even hand washed yet. These are items that either don't fit into the dishwasher or that I don't want to put into the dishwasher. I usually hand wash about 10 to 20% of the stuff in my kitchen. Everything else goes in the dishwasher. Now you'll notice here that I'm not using a sponge. I'm actually using our Makers Clean Scrub Square. This is a brand new product that we launched. We're really excited about it. And we wanted to bring flexibility to scrubbing in two ways. First of all, we want you to be able to clean it. So these cloths are machine washable. And second of all, we want you to be able to get it into all of those tight little spots with a really good quality scrubber. You'll see here, we've got a scrubby side for scrubbing and then a flat side for doing the actual cleaning. Now we do have a discount code. This is a brand new product. I'm going to link that for you down below. You can also visit makersclean.com to learn more. Now look how disgusting that cloth looks after cleaning that tomato sauce pan. But once I rinse it, you'll see how nicely it rinses clean. There aren't any chunks of food stuck in there. It's also fast drying and it doesn't smell. We're really proud of these scrub squares. We all love using them. And like I said, when you're done using them, you can put them right in your washing machine and have them ready for the next cleaning. My pan's looking pretty good. 
my hand wash items, I'm just going to quickly dry and replace, that way they're not in my way for the rest of the cleaning. All right, coming in for wave two. This is when I actually do my cleaning. So polishing, dusting, disinfecting. And notice my movements here. I'm starting at the top, working my way to the bottom, and I'm moving things out of the way as I go, always placing them on an area that I haven't cleaned just yet. The cleaning product I'm using here is simple all-purpose cleaner. It's just soap and water. But we do have a 50 DIY cleaners ebook that you can check out. I'll link that for you down below as well. It's always a good workout cleaning the kitchen. I get right up there and I get right down there. Lots of squatting and reaching and yeah, lots of cleaning. The kitchen table doesn't require much, but I'm still going to give it TLC. I just pre-treated the table with my general all-purpose cleaner that I use to pretty much clean everything in the kitchen. I'll use my microfiber cloth to clean the majority of the table, but for this area where the meat sauce spilled last night, if I wanted to, I could switch to the scrubby section of the scrub square and use that to easily work away the buildup. That just makes my job a little bit quicker, and then I can switch to the flat side of the scrub square to wipe clean, or I can just swap out and use my microfiber cloth to do the entire table. I'm completely ruthless when it comes to whipping crumbs on the floor because I know I'm going to clean the floor at the end anyway. But when I come to a surface like the island where I know just by looking straight down, let alone doing the eye level test, how much debris is on there before I even pre-treat it, I'm just going to give it a quick wipe down just to shoot a lot of that debris onto the floor. Why is that? Because once that debris gets wet, like I got rid of some shredded cheese, it's actually harder to wipe away and it leaves more of a mess. So by doing that quick step ahead of your pre-treating, you're actually saving yourself some time. The eye level test is also something Clean My Space fans might know about, but if you're new here, let me explain. When you look straight down on a surface, you can't always see the debris and dirt that's there. But if you get down to eye level, you'll be able to see everything that's there. Okay, I've reached the end of wave two and I finished the counters, the cupboard fronts, I've done my polishing, my cleaning, everything looks good. The final thing I have to do is clean the sink. I'll show you how I do that. But before I go there, I just wanted to talk briefly about the backside of the kitchen, the fridge, these cupboards, the microwave. It all looks really clean. So when I finish my wave, I'm constantly looking for areas that need cleaning, but I'm also looking for areas that don't need cleaning. And when they don't need them, I'm not giving them any extra attention. So without wasting any more time, I'm gonna clean that sink and then we're gonna take care of the floors and the garbage for wave three. Okay, I'm applying dish soap to the scrubby side of the scrub square, adding a bit of water, and I'm just going to scour. Now I'm not using any abrasive product here like baking soda or any scouring powder. The cloth itself and the dish soap will do a great job. I'll give it a rinse and then I'll finish it up by buffing with our duo cloth. And look how perfect the sink is. Yes. The last part of the cleaning, wave three, is emptying the garbage and taking care of the floors. Now I checked the kitchen garbage here, it doesn't need to be thrown out, but the compost definitely does, and boy I cannot tie a compost bag with gloves on. Once this is done, I'm going to vacuum the floor. I much prefer using a vacuum, then I do a broom for this particular type of work because it's just so much more effective. But that said, if there's a lot of wet stuff on the floor, I might grab that by hand or I might use a broom. I just find a vacuum much more efficient. But I'll tell you, my cat, she does not like the vacuum. Now let's go right from the kitchen over to laundry. In my house, those rooms are right beside one another and we are gonna talk about laundry pods and if they actually work and how you should be using them properly. Let's do it. When I think about laundry packs, there are three key issues that they have set out to solve. The first has to do with mess. That one's pretty simple. Powders and liquids are messy. You constantly have drippy bottles or powder everywhere, stuff that you have to clean up. You might even get it on your hands. So 
packs solve that problem. Next, dosing. And this has been a huge challenge with liquid and powder, actually, whether you're in a top load or a high efficiency front load or a high efficiency top load. And that is because, well, there are so many reasons. First of all, it's hard for us to gauge how much detergent our machine needs to get our clothes clean. Because high efficiency machines use less water, the more soap that lingers around in the machine that hasn't been rinsed through, the more soap stays on our clothes, the dingier our clothes look, the smellier our machines get. Plus, if we have a really heavy and dirty load, we need more detergent. But how much more detergent? You see, it's anyone's guess. And using liquid detergent kind of became a little open to interpretation. And finally, when we think about what has to happen in laundry for everything to work together in concert, sometimes we have to add a multitude of products to deal with, you know, oxygen bleach, to deal with stains, to deal with odors, to make things smell better. So you'd have to add a lot of different products to your load at different times. When we think about a pack, it kind of solves all three of those problems. It's clean, it's efficient in terms of dosing, you know exactly how many pods you need to use for the type of load that you have, and it can combine a multitude of different chemistry into one tiny pack. Oh, and one other little bonus, cherry on top, they use so much less water. So a pack can carry much more detergent in a much more condensed little space. Before I go on, on the Laundry Pack 101 dissertation, I will tell you that I wrote a full article that's available over on cleanmyspace.com. I'll link it for you down below. So if you want more information, more detail and more resources, that is all contained within that post. That obviously begs the question, what are these packs made of? Well, they are made of a well-researched, fully biodegradable and dissolvable film called polyvinyl alcohol or PVOH. Now this has been used for many years across the cleaning industry. And while it is petroleum based, I actually thought it might be plant-based, but upon further research, I found that plant-based products like this are available. Sadly, they're just too expensive right now. My hope is that plant-based will become the norm, but right now, yes, these are petroleum-based. Now you might be wondering what happens to these laundry detergent packs when they break down in the wash. So they will break down in the wash and I'll cover that off more in a sec. What'll then happen is they'll rinse away with your wash water. They go into a water treatment plant as regular wash water does. Bacteria and microbes feed on this and then whatever is left behind then goes into regular waterways. Bacteria and microbes continue to biodegrade and by 90 days or less, 100% of this pack has been biodegraded. Now let's talk about the difference between PVOH and microplastics because I did get a lot of questions about this in the post that I made on Instagram and I wanted to address it. And I will also say, I've got a link to the American Cleaning Institute in that article. They go into great detail about this. I actually found it a really interesting read. But microplastics cannot be biodegraded. So that's the difference here. Indeed, these are fully biodegradable. Now, the reason why packs, in my opinion, supersede liquid in terms of capabilities and performance is because these chambers allow laundry detergent manufacturers to separate different types of chemistry. Whereas if they were all mixed in together in one liquid, we wouldn't actually be able to get the benefits of all of these different products contained in one little pack. Now, what could be contained in these packs? Well, a variety of different things, depending on the type of detergent that you choose, and of course, the quality of detergent that you choose. Could be anything from surfactants, which of course lift dirt to the surface, to enzymes, which help break down tough dirt, bringing that up to the surface, to polymers, which help to separate dirt from your clothing once they've been washed away so that they don't redeposit, to antioxidants, which help prevent the odor causing bacteria from breaking down and releasing odors to builders and keelants, which help to purify the wash water and prevent things like 
chlorine and hard water minerals from building up, which can prevent your laundry from coming out clean. People with hard water especially understand this challenge. So again, when you pick something up like this, you can trust that it's got a lot of interesting chemistry at play and you can really customize your laundry experience based on the type of laundry pack that you pick up. You want to put your laundry packs in first. You want them at the bottom and ideally toward the back. You want them to get the most possible water on them as quickly as possible. And in fact, some machines are now being designed with detergent trays specifically built for laundry packs so that a little chute or like a water slide exists for them to go down, water hits them, and then they enter and explode and just do their thing in the washing machine right off the bat. Now let's say, and I've heard this from a lot of people, that the pack doesn't fully dissolve because for whatever reason, maybe they didn't put it in the right way. It's not a big deal, but there are two things to remember. First of all, you wanna get the pack off your clothes by simply taking it to a faucet, running it under cold water, and just getting rid of the laundry detergent. You will also want to consider redoing that load of laundry because of course you didn't get the right amount of detergent in there so your load will not be clean but generally speaking in my experience it should not harm your clothing first and foremost check the back of your package it will always tell you how to appropriately dose your packs for your laundry now you'll notice here i've got one without color and of course without scent i've got one here with color with scent and they are different sizes they also have different components in their chambers so they do entirely different things a i'm not mixing and matching and b these have different dosing requirements even though they're both made by the same company and ostensibly should do the same thing which is why again check your package but generally speaking one laundry detergent pack is good for one eight to 12 pound load of laundry. So if you think about the size of a laundry basket, like back in the nineties, that's the size. And I'm not saying heaping over like what you would expect at an ice cream shop when they give you like a giant scoop. That's not what we want our laundry baskets looking like. However, if you've got more going in there or your garments are heavily soiled, you wanna consider adding an additional laundry pack so that it can do its work. The long and the short of it is read the package and stick with one to two, maybe three if you really got yourself dirty. A few other quick things to keep in mind. I do not agree with decanting. These come in very purpose-built packages to make them childproof and to protect them from moisture. So please just keep them in the packages. The packages are fine. Next, don't burst these or fiddle around with them. They are delicate and you want them to burst or explode or do whatever they're gonna do right here in the machine. Obviously keep them away from pets and kids. Uh, and while they look cute, they do contain laundry detergents, so just keep that top of mind. I'm not sure what's more depressing, watching an older video of younger me or having to clean walls and baseboards, but you're about to do both because this is a classic video that we filmed probably eight or nine years ago now where I show you just how to do that. Walls and baseboards might not be exciting to most people, but every now and then you gotta clean them. And that's probably why you're watching this video. Well, we didn't wanna make a whole big feature length film about cleaning walls and baseboards. I thought I'd put together a quick little tip for you on how you can get this done. Walls, in case you haven't noticed, are vertical surfaces. Dust lands on horizontal surfaces. So your walls aren't going to get necessarily dusty, but they will get stains, scuffs, and fingerprints so that is what we're going to focus on cleaning. If you want to clean your walls, you should clean them maybe once a year thoroughly during spring cleaning, or if you're preparing to paint your walls, that's the other time you want to clean them thoroughly. Otherwise, you're just going to be focusing on spot cleaning. Prior to doing any wall cleaning, whether it's spot cleaning or the full-blown wall cleaning, you always want to test what you're using in an inconspicuous area. And that's important because some paints can't handle being cleaned and will leave a permanent 
kind of wet mark on the wall. So to find an inconspicuous area, go behind a piece of furniture, give it a quick little wipe and see what happens. To clean your wall, fill a bucket with hot water and add about a teaspoon of dish soap. The next thing you're going to do is take a sponge mop. Dip that in the bucket, let it saturate, wring it out really, really well, and then work your way from left to right. Do the W pattern, the one we talk about doing with vacuuming, up and down your wall. Once that's done, you'll wanna dry the wall. And the easiest way to do this is to put a microfiber cloth on a flathead mop and repeat the same motions that you did for the actual wall cleaning. Starting from the left, working your way to the right. If you notice any fingerprints, streaks, or marks that are on the wall, and you don't wanna to have to break out the whole mop and do the whole wall cleaning shtick, you can spot clean the wall and it's super easy to do. Just take a dampened microfiber cloth and dip the tip into a little bit of baking soda and gently clean off the stain. Follow it up by buffing it dry with a dry cloth. That will get rid of all the residue. The baking soda provides a tiny bit of abrasion which should help rub off any marks or stains. Now remember, you do wanna test this in an inconspicuous area as well. Sometimes baking soda or even magic erasers can actually remove paint off the wall. If you have greasy stains on your wall, this is a simple fix for that. Grab yourself a stick of white chalk and scribble over that greasy area. The chalk will help absorb any of that oil, gently wipe it off, and then spot clean that area as we just discussed. Baseboards are kind of like the old man ear hair of a house. They need to be maintained every now and then, and when they aren't maintained, you can certainly tell. So you don't have to do it all the time, but when it starts to become a little bit obvious, pay attention to your baseboards. If you wanna clean your baseboards, resist all temptation to use a mop and wipe them off along the baseboard. That will have the dust sticking to the baseboards and leaving this gross sticky streak of dust. It looks horrible and it is so obvious that you did it the wrong way. So instead, I'm gonna show you the right way to do it. It's super simple. Get the brush attachment of your vacuum and just quickly brush up any of the dust along your baseboards. If you want to wipe your baseboards, take a dry microfiber cloth, dust the baseboard with one hand, have a wet microfiber cloth in the other hand, give that a quick wipe, and that will clean your baseboards. All done. Whether you have laminate countertops, marble, natural stone, or something else, there is a DIY counter cleaning recipe for you. You do not have to go out and spend $10 on a spray bottle with a fancy product. I got your back. Watch this video and you'll figure out the recipe. We'll start off by making a product that I can safely say I use every day, which is why I called it the Everyday Countertop Cleaner. So the reason this is such a great product to DIY is because you don't need much to clean your countertops, just frankly, nothing more than soap and water. I've never understood why someone would go out and spend money on a fancy countertop cleaner or even on an everyday multi-surface spray when you could quite literally make your own for pennies. In a clean spray bottle, you'll add two cups of water, one teaspoon of dish soap, and 10 drops of your favorite essential oils or a mix of essential oils. A scent combination I love for kitchen counters is any combination of citrus. I've chosen grapefruit and lime, but you could do lemon lime, tangerine, orange, bergamot. There are so many members of the citrus family, some crazier than others, that you can mix in and have some fun with. Either way, citrus is bright and uplifting and the perfect choice for a kitchen. To use this, give it a little shake, Spray the area you want to clean liberally. Let the product sit for a minute or two so that the soapy water can do its work. And then with a microfiber cloth, you're going to use the S pattern to clean the surface. This is safe for pretty much every countertop I've ever encountered, no pun intended. But do me a favor and check out the video we have linked down below all about how to clean your countertops properly. Different materials require different things, but this is one that I would say is safe for the majority of countertop surfaces out there. Dusting like dishes and laundry is just a fact of life when it comes to cleaning. So in this video, I'm gonna go through some of the more basic as well as some of the more involved dusting techniques and show you how to nail them each time. In this video, 
I want to help you dust off your dusting skills because dusting isn't taught in school. Most people don't know how to do it professionally or properly. And in fact, if you dust incorrectly, you can waste time and make your cleaning efforts futile. You're going to have to repeat your work. So I want to help you learn how to dust properly so that you don't have to waste your time so that you can like dust it literally. So let's do it. The black stripes on my shirt can only mean one thing. Black Friday is here. And that means that makersclean.com is having an across the board sale. It's our biggest sale of the year. I know so many of you wait for it to stock up on your favorite Makers Clean products. So you can visit our website, makersclean.com or click that link down below. Our sale is up to 50% off on every item we have. Go check it out. When you dust a surface, Keep in mind that dust is like a tiny little slurry of all kinds of things from your fabric, from your skin, from your pet's dirt. And it's just this fine little mist that exists. And if it gets wet, it becomes like a streaky sort of paste that can be hard to clean off, especially if you're cleaning a baseboard or a surface that has a thicker dust. So what this tells us is that when we're dusting, we always wanna do it with a dry cloth. The mistake I see people making often is they will spray a cloth and they will use that to dust a surface. And in fact, that is making them work harder because now they've got this streaky slurry they have to get rid of. So remember, dust first, then clean. What I like to teach here on Clean My Space is understanding the PTTs, the products, tools, and techniques to get a job done right. When it comes to dusting, the tools are key. So let's talk about a few of the tools. I sometimes hear people talk about dusting with an old rag or a disposable duster or a super fluffy duster or even just a flat cloth, like something you would use to clean your glasses off. The truth of the matter is this, microfiber is what you want to use for dusting. That is because it has tiny little fibers that pick up dust and it also holds a bit of an electrostatic charge, which makes dust literally magnetic toward the cloth. So it does a lot of the work for you. If you use a general purpose microfiber cloth, it will dust like nothing else. If you use a cotton cloth or a rag or a cloth diaper or anything like that, that is a linty cloth. It's actually gonna leave lint behind. And if you use a disposable product, well, it was designed to be thrown out. So A, it's not good for the environment, but B, it's not designed with the same type of technology that would go into a reusable product uh, tool, I was gonna say product, like a microfiber cloth. So when you're picking your cleaning cloth, make sure that it is an, a general purpose sort of um, terry weave microfiber cloth. Anything else will make you work harder. When I teach people how to clean, I talk about the three wave system. And if you're not familiar with it, I'll put a link for a video teaching you all about this fabulous system in the description box down below. But the order is simple, tidy, in the first wave, do your cleaning in the second wave and deal with your floors in the third wave. And that is because dust falls down to the floor. And if you vacuum before you do your cleaning and your dusting, you're gonna leave dust behind. Not only that, cleaning, the action of disturbing your surfaces actually kicks dust up. So by the time you're done your cleaning, the dust that you have ostensibly kicked up should have fallen to the ground. I like giving rooms a little bit of time to breathe after I clean, so that way I know the dust has fallen to the ground and then I can vacuum it up and move on. If you vacuum first, you might find that dust resettles quicker um, and you might have to redo your work. Now, the only time it's appropriate to vacuum first is if you have a lot of pet hair in a home. In that case, I recommend the old vacuum sandwich where you vacuum first, do your cleaning second, and then finish off with a vacuum at the end. But that's the only time. Otherwise, vacuum at the very end. Don't take your cleaning advice from an actor, okay? The way that actors use feather dusters is they kind of go like this because it looks cute and like French maid like. That is not how you use a feather duster. And in fact, I don't like using feather dusters. I think they serve a very limited purpose. 
I think they're good for certain high dusting applications. They can help get down uh, cobwebs in certain situations. But the problem with them is their plume, their feathers kind of spread dust everywhere. If you plan on using a feather duster, the technique is to move from one side to the other in quick strokes. And when you're done using it, bring your feather duster down as low to the ground as possible generally to your ankle and tap it off so that the dust falls right there to the floor. Then you can pick it up and use it again. If you're doing this, you are literally shooting dust all over the room, which will then resettle on other surfaces and make you work harder. I know it can be tempting to see a little area of dust and just walk over to it and give it a quick wipe, but you are wasting your time because you have a horizontal surface and there are other things on it, you might as well just remove everything from that surface, dust the surface entirely, dust each item that was on that surface over the floor, and then replace each item. If you just casually do a wipe, it's going to stick out like a sore thumb. And then you're going to say, gosh, I should have just cleaned the whole shelf. And then you're going to have to redouble your work. So do it properly, remove everything from the shelf, dust, clean the shelf stuff, Put it all back, you're saving time, you're doing it right. Whenever you're dusting, you wanna work with gravity. You wanna start at the top and work your way to the bottom. If you dust something at waist height and then you realize, oh, there's something over there on a shelf that I need to dust, well, now you're gonna dust that item. Dust is gonna fall right back onto that waist height surface and then you're gonna to have to clean that again. There's no use in wasting your time. Always dust from the top to the bottom. If you observe a professional cleaner, you'll notice that they can often clean a lot of surfaces with one cloth and they're not really being that gross. I'll tell you why. Professional cleaners have a trick whereby they divide their cloth in two quarters, or I should say they fold their cloth into quarters, and that gives them eight cleaning surfaces. Whereas if you're just a regular average guy or gal, you're taking a cloth like this, kind of bundling it up and doing a cleaning, and you're getting a lot of surface area dirty or covered in dust. When you divide it into quarters like this, you're giving yourself eight surfaces. So when this gets dirty, you flip it over here, then you can flip your cloth this way and work with that side and then that side, and then you can flip your cloth in the absolute other direction and start all over again. A microfiber cloth can hold eight times its weight in water and even more in dust. So that means one cloth like this is gonna get you a lot of mileage as long as you use the folding trick. When we clean, we often focus on the areas that we can see the most, which tends to be whatever is at our eye level and slightly downward. The area that we clean the least tends to be the stuff that's high up. So ledges over your doors, crown moldings, light fixtures, corners, tops of cabinets and furniture, etc. Now the issue with that is dust can build up over time. And if a gust of wind blows or there's a fan going, you're gonna get dust falling and raining down in clumps. Not only that, it does lead to indoor air quality issues and an overall sense of stuffiness indoors. So I'm not saying you have to do it all the time, but just pay a little bit more attention to the, the stuff upstairs. I've run a professional cleaning business since 2006, and we use our clients' vacuum cleaners, which means if they have a malfunctioning or poorly maintained vacuum, it actually means we have to work harder on the dusting side of things. And that's because vacuuming and dusting are very much related. You can't remove all of the dust from a home if the vacuum is not working well. So what does that mean? It means that your vacuum has to be properly maintained. Your bin has to be emptied or your filter bag has to be replaced. Your filters have to be cleaned and maintained if your vacuum has cleanable filters. And you wanna make sure that it is sealed properly. And that means that when your vacuum is on, it's actually trapping all of the dirt that it's vacuuming up. And then the air that's coming out the back of the vacuum isn't then blowing dirt back out behind you. I've been in situations before where I flicked on a vacuum and it's actually made the room dirtier because of what spat out. The second thing is we would sometimes have clients who would say, well, I don't need a vacuum. I have hard floor surfaces and I usually sweep or I just use a flathead microfiber mop that I bought in a store 
you know which brand I'm talking about. Now, here's the issue with that. Cosmetically speaking, your floors might look okay, but a vacuum's job is to actually remove dust from the atmosphere. When you're sweeping or just doing a quick microfiber floor, uh, microfiber pad floor clean, you're not necessarily getting rid of all of the dust in your home. That is a vacuum's job. And that is why I often talk about the importance of having a vacuum with good quality filtration, because that actually removes dust. And if you're doing that on a regular basis, you're not gonna have dust quickly resettling. In a home, if you sweep the floor, you'll notice within a little bit of time, dust will resettle on your surfaces because that's exactly what you're doing with a broom. You're kicking up a bunch of dust and the small microscopic stuff that you can't sweep up will resettle on your surfaces, meaning more dusting work for you. And now you can write your dissertation on dusting. Just a quick reminder, the Makers Clean Black Friday sale is on. We've got limited inventory. Our sale is up to 50% off items on our store. You can visit makersclean.com or click the link down below. I was using some of our cloths in this video, but we've got a whole bunch of other products as well. So go check that out. Now I've got a question for you and that is this week's comment question. And it's all about your vacuum and when the last time you cleaned it out was. I mean, a vacuum you would think is a self-cleaning tool. It's not, you actually have to maintain it. I'm thinking about mine and I haven't done it in a while. So this is a good reminder for me. Let me know when the last time you cleaned yours was in the comments down below. I can't believe that it has been a full hour of cleaning and you are the one who's done all of the hard work. I am proud of you. This is amazing. And I'd love to know in the comments down below where you are cleaning from. Where were you watching this? And what did you get done while you were watching this video? Another quick reminder before I sign off that our Makers Clean Black Friday week, kind of pre-gaming Black Friday sale, is happening right now. So go to the makersclean.com website, check it out, see what's there, load up your cart and get your hands on our best deals of the year. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.